Hi, I'm Paul Edwards with Norton Clipper, and today we're going to troubleshoot an iLube system on a high speed saw. To access the iLube system components, we must first take off the top cover, the air filter cover, remove the air filter, secondary filter. You'll notice the locking tabs that fit underneath the lip. To remove the air box, we first take out the two screws located here and here. To do this, use a T25 Torx driver. To remove the air box, simply grab it on the sides, squeeze in, rock, and pull up. The first test for the iLube system, after verifying that there's oil in the machine and no restriction, is to check for the enabling current. The enabling current is sent through the blue and white wires to the ignition coil. If the ignition coil sees five volts, then it knows it can accelerate to full speed. If it does not see five volts, then it will not accelerate. So first, separate the blue wire from the blue wire, then separate the white from the white, Then we're going to connect our multimeter black lead to the blue wire and the red lead will contact the white wire. We'll now start the unit. Five volts is present and the machine will not accelerate. The issue is that the ignition coil needs to be replaced. Five volts DC is not present and we do have oil in the system, then we need to inspect further the generator, the control module, and oil pump. After testing the control module's enabling current, we need to verify that the generator is functioning properly. In order to check the generator, first must remove the carburetor. To do that, we first disconnect the two electrical connections separate the fuel lines from the primer ball, then remove the four screws that attach the console to the body of the machine. To remove the air inlet elbow, first take out the retaining screws with a T25 driver. Right here. One here. Lift the elbow out of the way. Set it to the side. Next, we're going to remove the carburetor inlet by taking out two screws located, one located at three o'clock position, one at the nine o'clock position. Do not tamper with the screw. Again, T25 Torx driver. Lift the air inlet assembly out of the way. Now I'm going to remove this air inlet tube. I'm doing this just to open up the area where we can see what's going on. In actual repairs and diagnostics, this isn't necessary. Pull the carburetor away from the carburetor retaining flange and separate the hoses. Now we're going to remove the carburetor mounting flange. First take out the inlet suction tube ring. Take the suction tube and press it and push it behind the flange. Then we're going to remove two T25 Torx screws, one here, one here. Then to remove the carburetor mounting flange, simply grasp it, pull it straight up, and slide the hose grommet out the slot. 
detach the generator, we're going to separate the yellow wires from the green wires. Set our multimeter to the ohm setting. Does not matter which lead goes to which yellow wire. Take a reading, and here we have 2.2 ohms. The correct ohm reading is 1.8 to 2.6 ohms. If it's less than 1.8, the generator is defective. If it's greater than 2.6, the generator is defective. We now must check for a short to ground. Take one lead of our multimeter and make sure it is grounded to the machine. That it's in contact with the machine. We're verifying that we do have ground, which is good. Now take the other lead, touch one of the yellow wires, and slowly pull the starter rope so that the engine goes one revolution and we should see no change to our multimeter. If the multimeter has a change, shows a value, then you know that we do have a short to ground. And repeat that same test with the other lead. To remove the oil pump cover, take our T25 Torx driver and remove the three retaining screws. Next, rotate the machine 180 degrees. We're going to remove the starter cover by removing the four retaining screws with our T25 Torx driver. Next, we're going to remove the vibration isolating mounting screw located the bottom footing with a five millimeter hex key. Next, remove the upper vibration isolating screw with a six, six millimeter hex key or Allen wrench. Finally, we have the three main isolators. To remove that, we'll need two tools, T25 Torx driver and a 10 millimeter hex key. All right, to remove the vibration isolator, we'll use a manual tool, not an electric or impact tool, to take out and loosen a T25 Torx screw in the center of the vibration isolator. Simply loosen it up by hand. Once it's loosened, then take our 10 millimeter hex key and finish unthreading the isolator. And repeat with the remaining two isolators. Now we can move the engine forward just enough to get to the oil pump connection. To do that, lift up on the front left corner of the engine where the spring was that we took the first vibration isolator bolt out. Slide the engine forward just enough to expose the oil pump. If you like, you can completely remove the engine by separating the grommet for the generator wires from the frame. Disconnect the water tube 
and lift the engine out and away. To separate the control module from the oil pump, I like to loosen and remove the oil pump retaining screw so I can rotate the pump out to allow more room for my fingers. Once it's moved out just a little bit, take a pair of needle nose pliers, move the spring away from the pump to expose the oil pump hose, then grab the oil pump hose with the pair of needle nose pliers and pull away from the pump. To separate the control module from the pump, depress the connections and pull up. To test the iLube control module, we'll first look at the oil hose. If this hose is stained black, so dark that you cannot see the oil inside, that's a sign that the operator has been using automotive oil in the machine. If that is the case, then the, the compression would need to also be checked. If this is stained black, the control module would need to be replaced. To test the control module, we'll connect the leads from our 12 volt AC, alternating current power supply, to the green power in leads of the control module. Take the red lead of the multimeter and we'll touch the conductor going to the oil pump, the red one. Take the black lead and contact the black lead coming from the, from the pump. A properly working high lube control module will pulse the oil pump every 16th of a second with 18 volts DC current. That's DC direct current. One. To test the oil pump, place your multimeter on the ohm setting. Take one lead from your multimeter, touch one of the conductors powering the oil pump, touch the other one to the other conductor, uh, conductor, and the ohms should be between 14 to 22 ohms. If less than 14 ohms, the oil pump is defective. If greater than 22, the oil pump is defective. One. The final test of the oil pump is to energize it. We'll use a 12 volt DC power source. You can also use any power source that's 12 volt to 18 volt DC. Polarity does not matter. Take one lead of my 12 volt DC current and touch one of the conductors. Then I'll apply the other one, tapping it on and off, and you should hear it click. And oil should spit out of the oil pump. If you have both the click and oil coming out of the pump, the pump is good. After replacing the defective part, we'll now reassemble the machine. The reassembly of the machine is the exact opposite of disassembly. Take our control module, drop it into place. Note that the smooth side of the control module goes to the back of the machine. Connect the electrical connection first. Then attach the oil hose. Followed by the retaining spring. Make sure the spring and the hose are pushed all the way against the oil pump. Next, reattach the oil pump mounting hardware. Anytime I attach a screw into plastic, I will use a hand tool, never use an electrical tool. 
be sure to guide the generator power leads, the yellow wires, through the frame and also attach the grommet to the frame. Next, we'll attach the three vibration isolators. To attach those, I'll find it easier to first thread in the center screw for T25 Torx driver about half to three quarters of the way in. Then hand tighten the plastic outside component. Repeat with the other three isolators. After we've snugged those into place, we'll fully tighten the center screw and use our 10 millimeter hex wrench to tighten the outer plastic component. And tighten with our six millimeter hex wrench. Finally, attach and tighten the last vibration isolator using a five millimeter hex wrench. Next, reinstall the starter, or some people call it the recoil housing. Place the air guide in first, aligning the four mounting holes with the four balsas in the casting. Align the starter housing to the air guide. Pull on the recoil rope to, while pressing on the outside of the starter housing to align the starter pins with the dogs on the flywheel. Reattach our oil pump cover. For this, I'll use a manual T25 Torx driver as these three screws go into plastic. Reattach the water hose to the fitting. Reconnect the generator leads, that's the yellow wires to the green, does not matter which goes to where. Keep in mind that these are a double bullet connector. So when you press it on, it'll click once, press it until you hear the second click. If not, it can work its way loose. And two. All right, slide the yellow leads under the retaining clip. To install the carburetor flange, first slide the hose grommet into the slot. At this point, I'm not going to be concerned with the impulse tube or the suction tube. I'm going to leave those on the back side of the carburetor flange. The trick to installing this is that leading edge of the flange needs to stay behind the frame here, this leading edge behind the frame here, and this slot lines up with this edge. To do that, start with the flange at an angle towards you or the rear of the machine. Push the grommet all the way in. 
slide the leading edge behind the lip in the frame, start to push down and rotate the flange into the upright position. Now we'll install the two mounting screws. Pull the hose and wire through the grommet as much as possible. Next, we'll fish or pull the suction tube through the carburetor flange with a pair of needle nose pliers or our fingers. Now the impulse tube, we'll slide it through the impulse tube grommet. Next, attach throttle linkage. Place the suction tube ring in the opening. Take the carburetor, position it so that the automatic choke power cable is towards the rear of the machine. The hoses hook up are as follows. This is for the suction tube. This is the fuel inlet. This is the fuel return going to the primer bulb. And finally, the oil hose. So connect the hoses. I like to connect the throttle linkage before connecting the fuel inlet hose. Note that I took the carburetor, um, carburetor choke power cable, moved it under the white and blue wires from the control module. And finally, the impulse tube. Next, if you remove the air hose, inlet tube, we will connect it. This screw again will attach manually as it's threading into plastic. Next, install the air inlet horn. Note the fuel line coming from the carburetor going to the primer bulb will be underneath it and the return line going from the primer bulb to the fuel tank goes over the top. Drop the elbow into position. Note it only goes one way. The legs go down, opening towards the top with the two screw holes. We'll attach two mounting screws, one on the right, one on the left, using our T25 driver and attach this by hand as it is screwing into plastic. Now we'll attach the console. Be aware of this wire as it will go underneath the air intake elbow. It's easy to get it caught between the console and this thinner man nut. Now I'd like to connect the fuel lines. Remember, the long hose coming from the carburetor attaches to the short leg on the primer bulb. The short hose going to the T is our return to the fuel tank. It connects to the longer lead on the primer bulb. Now the line the slot in the back of the console, the top of the carburetor flange, slot inside the back of the console, lines to the top of the carburetor flange. 
Make sure no wires are pinched. And the console fits flush around the frame. Then attach the four mounting screws. Connect our electrical connectors. Connect our blue wire to our blue wire. Just to check to make sure the throttle linkage is not binding or hitting every, anything. Place our fuel vent line into the clips. I like to press this elbow down into the machine as much as possible. Verify that our blue and white wire are around the air intake, as shown. To install the air box, first lower the operator's left side into the, the body. Squeeze in on the right side, and then as I'm pushing down, I'm going to press down and twist in a clockwise fashion. And it should fall right into place, which it did. Now attach the two retaining screws. Seeing that these screws go into plastic, I'm going to use a T25 manual driver. Reinstall the secondary filter. Snaps into place. Drop your air filter into place. Place the air filter cover and tighten. Replace the top cover and tighten the four screws. And that's how you troubleshoot an iLoop system on a high-speed saw. Hope you enjoyed this video, and be sure to check out more from Norton Clippers.